Greetings Metanistas. We did say at the end of the last video that it was getting too long and it had to be continued. So folks, here is the continuation. And if you remember, we went to the Victoria and Albert waterfront and tried a lot of traditional South African specialities. However, I did think to myself, well hang on a second, this is a very plush touristy area of Cape Town, why don't we go and try eating in the area where most South Africans live. So that meant heading out to a township, so join me for today's vlog where we partake in a traditional township Chesanyama. So Mutton-Easters, we've now ventured somewhere where tourists don't usually go. We have come to a township. Now, many of you remember on the news, South Africa in the bad old days, people being split into different areas by race, but obviously there's a lot more racial harmony now. But these townships are still here and they're still overwhelmingly black. But it doesn't mean the food is bad though, and we are here to try some of the local traditional food. So Muttonistas, we've come to Rands in the Kailetsia Township. I'm not good at Afrikaans or South African words, let alone the Khosa word, but uh, it's quite a buzzing place, outdoors, open air. So rather than coming here for a braai, we've come here for a chesanyama, which is the local word for a barbecue. No reason why the food shouldn't be any good. It was great when we had traditional stuff earlier. I can't wait to try it. Let's get stuck in Muttonistas. Wow, I can smell the smoke in here, so the meat and the sausages are going to be pretty freshly grilled and smoked. It's kind of crispy, sweet, marinade type stuff. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's stuff that's already been cooked. Yes. Look, but that would be, you know, that's the kind of thing that's prepped to the point where it could go for a final grill on the bride. Okay, so okay. I understand. Of, of so I think maybe <coughs> a little bit of each. Okay, let's do that, let's do that. Then just go for a little bit of each, except maybe don't worry about... Well, what's the sausage going? Well, you the sausage again. Yeah, whatever, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, uh... A little bit of it. The two of us, and a little bit of everything. So folks, that's our plate of meat, which has been carefully weighed to price it all up. And I believe it is going to get marinated in spices and then grilled for us. So, massive freezer with all the meat waiting to be cooked. And this is where it all happens. Massive charcoal barbecue, sausages and pork and lamb, beef. I wonder at what point the marinade goes on. The marinade will go on like towards the end, otherwise we'll burn. Okay. So there we are, the marinade goes on towards the end, otherwise it'll burn if it's put on early. You get some kind of marinade where it's first marinated first and then it, the type of marinade will burn. Gets ah, okay. Like, yeah, they on the other so, judging by the presence of a DJ and all these open air tables and these big woofers, uh, this place is one big party in the late afternoon and evening. And my guess is that these sauces are nay too mild. So, unfortunately, the music. Uh, cranked up at this point and became very loud and not just for the obvious copyright reasons I can't show the at time or live audio and to be honest I had to shout to make myself heard above the music anyway we did have the meat platter and that contained some sausages a beef sausage like a Boer's uh, some chicken 
some lamb, some beef ribs, and some pork rashes, they call them. It wasn't quite like bacon, but it wasn't far off. And I have to say, it was all beautifully marinated. And if you needed a little hotter, those chilli sauces really did do the trick. Anyway, I washed this down with a Windhook beer, a Namibian beer that uh, you've probably seen on another vlog of mine. Very popular beer, very light and refreshing, not too strong alcoholically. Now, as for the meats themselves, it was actually a mixed bag. Yes, the marinade was good, but uh, a couple of the cuts were a bit tough, particularly the lamb. I wouldn't go for the lamb or the beef steak there, but the sausage was beautiful, the chicken, superb, the ribs and the rashes as well. And as for the veg, well, we had cream spinach, which was of a great consistency and flavour, the pap, which I tend to miss out on because it's just very filling, it's a maize starch, and, of course, the chakalaka, one of my favourites. And here, it was beautifully spicy. So you might ask me, well... Would you go to a township? Should you go to a township? Is it safe? Well, I would say I would recommend going there. I quite enjoyed my visit. Everybody was friendly and welcoming. However, it does help to know where you're going, so I wouldn't go on one's own. I would go with a guide. OK, Mutton Easter's probably the final stop of the day, but you never know with me. And we're back at another market. They do love their markets in this part of the world. We're at Boschendal Market, which is supposed to be one of the best. Now, the problem is there's a lot of music being played in the background, so it's likely, because of all the copyright rules and so on and so forth, that I am going to have to voice it over at the end. But we'll see how it goes. Okay, so some of the food and drink has come. Andre went to the farm shop, the little farm shop they have just over there in the background is the farm shop. And yesterday we had a pie. We had a springbok pie. So we've gone for their chicken pie, since pies are supposed to be of some importance here. And to drink, given we're at a winery, we had to uh, dip our toes in and give white and red a bit of a dabble. We have an Elgin Sauvignon Blanc, Boschendal even though we're not in the Elgin region, strictly speaking, and Boschendal Black Angus. And the ice is there just in case the red wine is a little too warm. I had never connected South Africa, particularly with Sauvignon Blanc, mainly because in the past I'd had reds and Chardonnays, but they are really rather nice, and this is no exception. Well, let's try the pie now. Shape on the pastry is pretty pleasant. The bottom, well, uh, a little bit soft, so I'm a bit worried this is going to ooze out. At the end of the day, a pie is just a pie, but for a chicken pie, that's not too bad at all. And what I'd also say for aficionados of pies is that there is actually a lot of chicken in there. So it doesn't mean some chunks of meat scraped off the spine swimming in gravy. It actually means that there is chicken in the pie. So those of you who love your pies, you're in for a treat here. Anyway, there's only so much pie that I can actually eat if I want to try other things. So uh, we're putting that down. Quick slurp. And we'll see what else this market has to offer. So, Andra and I have been joined by Nadia, her sister, who's been to this market a few times before. And we have managed to obtain some samosas. Now, I don't know why it's called samosa rather than samosa and what the difference is, but maybe Andre can fill us in with what the difference is. I'd say the difference is merely an incidental um, accent difference uh, of local sort of uh, Indian description versus elsewhere. Um, I can tell you that in South Africa, samosas generally come in this kind of, um, oh, I've chopped one into the dip, one second, it's already dipped for you. <laughs> I can tell you that in South Africa, samosas normally come in this triangular shape, 
where you do find them elsewhere but sometimes in India you get them in that more that three-dimensional triangular shape which you'll never find here so the ones that I've let out here are beef mm -hmm. and as you know in South Africa beef is very popular and as you know in India beef is a little bit taboo so to start off with this seems like a very good South African uh, okay option we will have beef some beef there. and what is in the dip it's an anise dip and beyond that I don't know perhaps uh, okay. some caramarine perhaps some tomato it looks to me something spicy and tangy okay. but you're the expert Aniseed I can taste and it's sort of a minced hashed beef. It's very lightly spiced. It's not blow your head off spicy or anything. Um, I would go easy on the dip if I were you. Not because it's that spicy, but because it's sweet and aniseedy with a bit of spice. It can overpower the beef in the samosa. And well, given it's beef, an excuse for me to move on to some red and have a quick slurp. Yep, that's a pretty good red. Slightly too warm, but not massively, so I'll stick with it without having to use ice. And then potato, and then um, cheese and corn. Okay, on to the chicken. The chicken, again, it's hashed up, minced up chicken, and it has a sort of very light curry flavour, much as you'd expect. And luckily, we still had a bit of white left to accompany the chicken. Mm. Quite a nice match with the spice. It doesn't cut through the spice too much. You hear people saying that it should cut right through the spice. I disagree. You eat spicy food for the spicy hit. Now onto the potato. Quick dunk in the sauce. And many of you viewing will have noticed I'd been in Pakistan before now. Now in India, a lot of the samosas come in big triangular parcels with a very thick pastry, um, almost like a pie. Of course, the other way of making samosas in Southeast Asia, even in China as a Cantonese stack, is to deep fry them in these little triangular parcels. However, potato, very much an Indian filling. And I'm sorry carnivores, the potato is doing it for me over the meat. Maybe it's because the meat's hashed up of not the best quality, although it wasn't bad, but this potato is bursting with curry flavours, it's soaked up all the spices, and it's very light. Now, some suggestion that I'm being a bit Mancunian as a lover of sort of chip butties and stuff like that, and loving carbs wrapped inside carbs. Nonsense. I like potato samosas and vegetable samosas over meat samosas. Cheese and corn now. Bit of a discussion going on between Andre and Nadi as to who chose the cheese and corn and who chose the potato, but uh, we do believe that the truth has come out and Nadia chose the potato, which was the best one so far. Cheese and corn, a little odd. I'm not actually getting too many Asian flavours there. Having said that, as a finger food snack, it would be perfectly pleasant. Just not particularly spicy or Asian in my opinion. So the potato wins. We have a Durban lamb curry. And I believe that most of the emigration from India to South Africa ended up in Durban. So famous for its Indian food. Or well, we tried to ascertain what makes a Durban curry a Durban curry. Well, the lady said, well, it's the recipe passed down from my mother, from my grandmother, and so on and so forth. So the only way we're really going to get to the bottom of this is by tasting it. And I have to say, it does actually look very good. Nice, thick, rich gravy with a bit of rice. Okay, so here we are, Matanistas, a closer. I was about to say not too spicy, but there is a sting in the tail here. It has a spicy finish. Very meaty, very tomatoey. But one thing that distinguishes this curry from those that you find in the subcontinent is that they're not as buttery. Uh, having been in Pakistan recently, one thing that I did spot with virtually every curry is that it was swimming in ghee or clarified butter. Not so this one. Okay, now a bit of the curry with the writer. For those of you unaware, writer is a type of yogurt, usually with cucumber or mint added. Often added to biryanis to moisten the rice, but sometimes to spicier dishes to cool it down. That was quite pleasant and what I would also say the lamb is actually pretty good. Obviously when you're in the subcontinent sometimes the meat is shall we say of dubious provenance. Sometimes it's quite good as well but uh, this is nice lamb. So now no messing about with the right and metanistas this time with some chili pickle. 
the pickle is good, very strong flavours, but the chilies are hot as well. I'm going to have to have a quick slurp, Matanistas. Oh, that's better. Anyway, we're going to polish all this off and we will see you in a few ticks when the plate's been demolished. Oh, and before we do move on to the next thing, I would say that the closest dish I can think of to that is actually beef rendang. It's not really coconutty like a Malaysian beef rendang. I can taste the tiniest bit of coconut in there. So, I thought the night was starting to draw to a close. No, no, Andre was having none of it. He has gone and found a shawarma stand. So, Andre, take it away and tell us exactly what you've got. Well, as you all know, I've been severely underfed today. <laughs> so, I've got one final thing. Uh, while we don't have the, quite the extensive um, range of, of donut kebabs that you get in England, we do have a bit of a culture locally of having uh, lamb and chicken shawarma. Lamb because it's quite a big thing in South Africa. Peru lamb is quite world famous and we have a lot of that here. And chicken because that's always the other alternative. One thing that's quite nice that I found at the stand that is a, is a, is a sort of a capelé type thing is that you get the sweet and tangy coriander chutney as it's called that they drizzle over the shawarma with a little bit of mayonnaise and let's see how it tastes. Well, as usual, I'm still at the crease after a long innings. Been playing my shots carefully and uh, avoiding the bad balls today. So let's plow on with the chicken shawarma. I've taken it out of the packaging so you can see clearly, even though uh, bad light might be stopping play soon. That is not what I was expecting at all. But that Malay relish is really quite different. Incredibly tangy and vinegary. Wow. I didn't realise that the Malays used that amount of vinegar in their relishes. A little bit of chilli, a little heat, not too much, but actually quite a nice addition and a nice change from the yoghurt and chilli based sauces that you usually get in kebabs and shawarmas. So I couldn't decide what to drink with that, so I thought I'd have a slurp of white just to play on the safe side and it does match pretty well. Now, Matanistas, if you remember, when we were in the Malay quarter of Cape Town, uh, at the start of the second vlog I did here, we had a Malay donut called a Koo Sister, and that was actually quite pleasant, not too sweet, got the day going nicely with a coffee. However, there is an Afrikaans version called a Kook Sister. Now, it has a slightly odd meaning in terms of the word itself, but even having been to a township, I believe this stuff is so sweet that it's the most dangerous part of the day for me. So, Andre, why is there a difference between the two words Koo Sister and Kook Sister? Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure how that distinction came to be, but I do know that a Kook Sister um, refers to quite cheekily in Afrikaans in a derogatory way, a lady who keeps her legs crossed and you can work out the implications yourself. And I can also tell you that it's a lot more sweet and it's kind of similar to, I think it's called Jal Jalabi. Jalabi. Jalabi, which is that South Asian deep fried uh, sort of doughy Sugary, batter that's yeah. then dipped into sugar syrup. Okay. Very similar kind of experience here. Having picked one up, this is probably more lethal than a firearm from how heavy it is, but uh, okay, let's try it. I'm sorry folks, that is gross, that is. That is diabetes in a ball of flour. Folks, unless you like ridiculously sweet things, uh, stay away from those. Now, do we have something a little more pleasant on the table, Andre? <laughs> well, we have another sweet treat. Um, I suppose we can call this a springbok tiramisu. It's a very easy dish to make, a French tart, and it's basically a layers of what I think South American countries call dulce de leche, caramel condensed milk, that is mixed with cream and then layered with tennis biscuits and peppermint crisp chocolates. And it's a favorite of um, housewives and house husbands across the country. It's a little bit sweet, but not quite as dangerous as the cook system, and you be the judge. Okay, well, I'm going to give this a try. It looks a lot better. I mean, nobody's promoted me to be anything as lofty as a house husband yet, but it uh, doesn't stop me from trying this dessert. Well, okay, folks, obviously it will be sweet to a point. I mean, it wouldn't be a dessert if it weren't, but... 
very pepperminty. It's like one of those old peppermint crispy biscuits you used to get with a coffee at the end of a meal, particularly in a South Asian restaurant. It's not bad, but again, it is actually pretty sweet, this. I mean, uh, I don't know whether a whole bag of Tate and Lyle's gone in there or not. It's okay, but uh, I'll just stick with the one mouthful. Okay, Matanistas, finally, a sweet that is not really South African. It has South African connections, but it's actually from Portugal. Yes, it's the Pastel de Nata. If you watch my videos from Porto last summer, you'll have seen me tucking into some fine examples of this. So I'm in a great position to give these some quality control. And I don't know why Pastels de Nata are famous in South Africa, so I'm going to leave it with Andre to explain this. So um, it's more of a theory than a solid explanation, but what we had the other night, it's very traditional, is the milk tart. So South Africa in the culinary repertoire already have a type of custard tart that is firmly entrenched and traditional. And possibly because of that, and possibly also because of our existing connection to Mozambique and the Portuguese food that comes from there, the pasta sonata in the last sort of five to six years has taken over every little um, boozy shop you can imagine all over the country. So I think that might be why. And so you could possibly see the pasta estonada as the modern South African milk tart. Okay, the light isn't great here, folks, but uh, just enough, I think, for you to see. From what I can see, it looks authentic, but let's see if the taste is authentic. Yeah, it has that sort of burnt creme brulee-ish top. And I have to say, folks, that is a pretty decent representation of a pastel donata. OK, the ones I had fresh out of the oven in Porto, they were the bee's knees, but these aren't far off. And I couldn't have such a tart of lofty quality without an espresso at the end. And the espresso is reasonable. For an open-air coffee stall, very, very acceptable. So, Matanitas, what a day we've had. We started off with a coffee, we finished off with a coffee. But in between, we had the seven colours, the beef poche and the uh, chicken sazotti. Very, very interesting local dishes. We had the game meats, the carpaccios. We moved on to a township, which I never thought I'd do. What an experience <laughs> that was. Uh, we had the weird African ice creams. And then we ended up at the Boschendal Market, where we tried everything under the sun, whether it was the Malay curry, the samosas, not samosas, which were some good, some bad, but the beef curry was excellent. Uh, we had a shawarma, and then we tried the dessert, one of which shall not be mentioned again, and then the pastel donatas, which were pretty decent. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the vlog. Big thanks to Andre. He's a great guide. Uh, he's not actually offering tours as such. I know him for personal reasons. But if he does offer guided tours in the future, and I believe he's working on a guidebook, this is the man to get in touch with. Follow his Instagram feed that I'm going to leave in the description box. Anyway, more to come from Africa. I'm stuffed. I'm going to love you and leave you all. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, don't forget, as always, you can't beat a bit of mutton. Beep.